it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Rachel Wall, who's been a mentor of mine at Inspired Hygiene for 25 years. I mean, you just been out there crushing it in dental hygiene. She's out there in Charlotte, North Carolina. As the founder of Inspired Hygiene, Rachel and the Inspired Hygiene team inspired dental teams to elevate their hygiene services and systems while increasing profitability. Drawing from her 25 years of experience as a clinical hygienist and hygiene profitability coach, Rachel delivers to the point articles and speaking programs. She has spoken for everyone, for numerous organizations, Yankee, ADA, Hinman. She received a 2012 Dental Excellence Award from drbicuspa.com, which by the way, I'm in Phoenix. They're just up the street in Tucson. And for most effective dental hygienist educator and was named one of the top 25 women in dentistry in 2013 by Dental Products and Report Magazine. Congratulations on that. That's two huge honors. Um, Actually, they named me, uh, Dental Products Report did name me the top 25 fattest dentist. And, uh, and T-Bone <laughs> made the list, too. And he was, he's, he's right up the street from you, right? He is. I love T-Bone. We'll give when, him a shout-out. When, out. when <laughs> we won the awards, he was, he was eating a steak, <clears throat> and I was a Dairy Queen. She can be, <laughs> Rachel can be reached by email at rachel at inspiredhygiene.com or by phone at 704-541-0995. And what, by the way, when you spell Rachel, it's R A C H E L. I always want to spell it R A C H A E L. Right. Um, but so it's Rachel. She says it's spelled the right way. R A C H E L. Your mom just wanted to do everything faster, easier, That's it. higher yep. in quality. And yep. her phone again, if you're at the 7 Eleven or Circle K right on the bathroom wall, 704 541 0995 for a good time. She's also worked as a hygienist in the perio faculty practice at UNC for three years with some of the premier perio researchers, David Paquette, Stephen Offenbacher, Ray Williams, um, was a student and participated in some data collection and studies on perio and preterm labor at UNC. Um, is, and she's based in uh, Charlotte, but she has uh, coaches and clients all across the U.S. You got one in my backyard in Phoenix. Uh, Kim, what's Kim's last name? Miller, Kim Miller. Kim Miller, and uh, I already like her because Miller Beer has, uh, they came out with the first light beer. I mean, I already like her. Is Still drinking. Her, is her real name Kim, Kim Miller Light or just Kim Miller? <laughs> but you know what? You know, UNC is an, a phenomenal dental school. Yeah. And it's funny that you were um, on the data collection studies on perio and preterm labor because when you talk to the insurance companies, the thing they are most interested in, the only thing they talk about about the oral health connection is the data they see um, when you have a preemie, it's a million bucks. Yeah. And they're linking um, gingivitis and gum disease. Yeah. And the last thing a uh, an insurance company wants is for someone to have a one or two pound baby. I mean, that's just the most expensive thing out there. So I, I think preterm, um, I, I think pregnant women... Healthcare is going to be the first uh, connection because in America, you can take it to the bank that money's the answer. What's the question? Yeah. And, and when those when those hospitals think about dentists, they, they just think, how do you keep pregnant women with gingivitis from dropping a preemie? But um, so you got a new book out. So what? Uh, uh, how, how many children do you have? We have our new book. This was one of my babies. Uh, but, you know, as we all say with our businesses or our books, I have. Two, two real life kids, uh, seven and almost 10, uh, Anna and Andrew, and they're blast. Well, I always say that um, it, it, the book is on roh.com or inspiredhygiene.com? Uh, the easiest way to find the book is rohbook.com. Oh, so if you type in, okay, see, I'm uh, not all right in the head. If you type in rohbook.com, that redirects you to inspired hygiene so you can right. remember it roh.com rohbook.com yep and the roh stands for return on hygiene i yeah. love that name and then and then it's going to redirect you to inspired hygiene and then it, i know you're driving so what i do is i always retweet my guest's last tweet and her last twitter tweet she's at at inspired hygiene and i just retweeted two of her tweets um one was in Jamie's latest video. She shares some inspiration for the next six months. 
don't let the next six months slip by. And then another one, Rachel, Kim, Jamie, and Emmy are excited to be going to the Speaking Consulting Network in Orlando, June 9th to the 11th. Yeah, we'll be there. Right on. And uh, that that's where we, we um, T-Bone, your neighbor, and Samir started the townie meeting. We had it for the first 10, uh, 15 years in Vegas. Yeah. And we scheduled the next two years in Orlando um, just because, um, you know, uh, millennials really don't want to smoke, drink martinis, and gamble. It's more it's more of a family fun practice place. Plus, I have two grandkids. That's kind of motivating me. There you but, go. Uh, so tell us about your book. I mean, I know that's a huge undertaking. What made you want to write a book? Well, it was time, Howard. I mean, we've been doing this for, um, I've been, Inspired Hiking started in 2004, so we've been doing this for a while. Uh, Kim, Jamie, Emmy, are, that's our coaching team, so we're all going to SCN together. That's actually where I met T-Bone, was at SCN in Vegas, um, gosh, probably about uh, 14 years ago. Um, right about the time when I started Inspired Hygiene, so we've known each other for some time, but it was way overdue, and, um, you know, just like we coach our clients, I have coaches, right? All of us in business should have coaches and mentors and people that help us get to the next level, so the book was part of her advice. She said, you know, you've developed this platform, we're speaking all over the country, but what's a way to get this message out even more and really help dentists look at, you know, how do we get a strong return on the investment of time, money, ener energy, leadership? How do we get a strong return on all that investment in the hygiene department that benefits the patients, first and foremost, the providers, right, that benefits the hygienist, and also the practice? And so we kind of took what we've learned about um, some of the stats of the hygiene department. So we, I call this the hygiene uh, hygiene benchmark Bible. So if you want to know how your hygiene department stacks up against industry standards and other practices across the country, this is a good way to find out. And so we just really give some good formulas, some things that dentists can really plug in the numbers and see where their hygiene department stands and where there might be some opportunity to grow and get a really strong return on the hygiene department. Do you think that dentists being dentists, I mean, they're obviously they're biased. They always want to learn more about root canals, fillings, and crowns. And I think that a lot of times the hygiene department becomes the orphan sister yeah. Uh, yeah. because they're, they're always off to another implant course. Or do you, do you feel that way? I hear that a lot from dentists themselves. You know, they'll call and say, uh, you know, hey, we haven't really been paying much attention to our hygiene department. And I've been in all of these other courses, and now it's time to focus here. And, and I remember years ago uh, when we were in a practice here in the Charlotte area, um, one of the dentists was showing me, you know, he had like the next generation CRAC that hadn't even been released. And he was just showing me all the bells and whistles. And he was one of the instructors and really, really great practice. And I asked him, I said, okay, so this is great. You're using next year's technology. Um, can I give you a little bit of coaching? And he said, sure, that's why you're here. I said, your hygienists are using ultrasonic units from 1990. And it's time to step it up. And he said, great, whatever you suggest, we'll do it. And they did. And they got great results clinically and also with the growth of their hygiene department. So, yeah, that, that happens a lot, actually. So um, they order your book on inspiredhygiene.com. And yeah. how much is the book? So the book is nineteen ninety five, but we have a promo code so everybody can get it for half price. So nine ninety five, and the promo code when they... Uh, go to check out is all caps Howard. So you have your very own promo code Howard that will live into eternity. <laughs> and and she she chose the name Howard after Howard Stern. It wasn't me. It was just Howard Stern. <laughs> because as I said, you're the Howard Stern of dentistry. So <laughs> you know, very well. So so um you've been I mean you you've been doing this for a quarter of a century, twenty five years. Yeah. Um, the dentist is driving to work right now. They got an hour commute to work, or they're on a treadmill or whatever. Um, you know, you only know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, they, they, they just have a hygienist. They have a department. I mean, it, it, anytime you get in a serious conversation with someone, bonding agents and implants or whatever, but when you have ask them details, like, well, how do you confirm your hygiene? They don't even, they can't even tell you. Right. It's like, oh, well, my hygienist does that with the reset. I mean, what, what, what are the, what are the common low hanging fruit problems you see in hygiene departments and what, what are your consultants going in and doing 
And, mm-hmm. and, and a big beef of mine is they always want to buy a new high-tech laser or start adding another dental procedure. And yeah. I always track the biggest return on investments is bringing in a consultant to get your house in order. And, yeah. and, I, and, I, and, I wanna, and I'm going to just, before you say what you see, I, I'm, I want to tell you the, the, the two funnels in the office. So we know four people have to call your front desk before she schedules one in the chair. Mm-hmm. And you have to get three people in the chair because you only have a 38% treatment plan acceptance rate. And we're just talking about cavities. We're not talking about veneers. So to get, you need three patients. So to do one filling, you need three butts in the chair. To get three butts in the chair, you need 12 incoming new calls. Okay. So then the back door, that, that's the front door. Yeah. And then when you're going out the back door, anytime you go to a mature office, they got 5,000 charts. 4,000 never came back. Why? The backdoor funnel. So you yeah. for, you forget to reschedule 12 people. Um, maybe you call three of them at some day. And then maybe one comes in. So you have this funnel that no one can get in. And then you have this huge funnel out the back door. To By the time yeah. they got 5,000 charts, they got 1,000 people. And if they could work on those two funnels, they double their net income. And, and then their next question is, what bonding agent do you use? Yeah, so it's it's interesting you say that because I've never I mean I've heard I've heard you say that before, but I've never really thought about it. And I am the worst drawer in the world. But it's kind of like it's kind of like the hourglass, right? So you've got all these people coming in, but only a few stay here, and then you got all these people going out. So you're left with this small, you know, amount of patients here that are really committed. And the first step is really figuring out, okay, so who are those people? Who are those people? How many of them are there? Because dentists are making uh, hiring decisions. They're making buying decisions. They're making construction decisions, sometimes based on, you know, the number of charts. But those people aren't in care. And so first it's important just to find out what are we looking at? It's like in any business, you know, the numbers aren't always the most In fact, sometimes they can be a little depressing, but once you know what they are and you start tracking it, then you can make improvements. But if we have our head in the sand, then it never gets any better. So um, I would say, you know, I've heard I've heard you say this and I just totally believe it is, you know, the most successful dentists aren't the ones that go to the CE and then try to translate everyone, everything to everyone. They're the ones that bring their whole team to the CE and they learn it together. And then now all of a sudden you know, uh, 20 years have heard the same message and they're all going to pick up something different and they're all going to have some ideas about how to implement it and they're all going to get the same energy and the same motivation. And so that's, we really encourage that too. And when we go in and do coaching, you know, while the end user uh, may be the hygienist or the end deliverer uh, of the product might be the hygienist, it takes the whole team to really get that department to the next level. And so all of our coaching involves the whole team and engages the whole team. But your question was, you know, what are some of the low-hanging fruit? Well, um, I'd say three things that really kind of put it all in a nutshell. And there's a lot of stuff that falls under into these three buckets. One is, is the recare and the appointment verification system is, you know, that's probably, that's probably the number one complaint we hear. Um, from practice owners is the cancellations and no-shows. And one of the things that I say to them is, okay, so let's, um, you know, that's a conversation that, you know, all of us consultants could talk about for days. But um, first, know what it is you're dealing with. Typically what we um, say is if you're seeing over 20, 20% are over open time, and we, we show you how to calculate that here. Super simple calculation. If you are at 20% or more open time, there's very often not just a cancellation problem, but a capacity issue. So there aren't enough patients flowing into hygiene. But sometimes, you know, the business team or the doctor or the hygienist kind of says it's all cancellations. But if you really were to go back a month and really track how much of that time was never scheduled to begin with, if you're at 20 percent or more open time, there's going to be a significant amount. And so what does that mean? You know, does that mean recare, new patients, um, and and then the cancellation is a whole nother issue. You know, Kim actually is the perfect person to interview about an appointment verification system and how to dramatically how to cut cancellations in half. 
Um, she's done it over and over. She teaches our clients how to do it. She'd be a great person to interview about that. And she's um, in Phoenix. Yeah, and she's in Phoenix. Uh, Is she and, still alive or was she killed by a melanoma? No. She's very careful, and she is, like, the healthiest person I know living in Phoenix, I will tell you. And she's got beautiful skin, so she knows she knows a secret. Um, and all of our coaches teach the same concept, something that Kim kind of created and coined. But, uh, but the other thing that's interesting, and that leads us to the second low-hanging fruit, is, you know, I've been doing this a long time and speaking and coaching, and you kind of think that people get tired of hearing the same message, but still we get calls every day from practices that have no real structured perio program, or maybe they had one once and some of the hygienists left, um, or maybe there was some obstacle that they came across and it just kind of all went away and they're not really implementing it. And, you know, there are all these perio patients that are having profies and everybody's kind of frustrated, but they don't really know what to do about it. And that's where some open time can actually be a good thing because if you're building your perio program, now you've got somewhere to put those patients and it can help close some of those gaps. So there's still um, a lot of opportunity for practices to refine that. Um, and even if you are at the 25% perio range, which is pretty good, um, still very often when we do an analysis of that, we find that it's either being carried by perio maintenance, that percentage, or it's all new patients. And then they've got all these, you know, 1,500 existing patients that, that maybe are having a perio exam but have disease and are still going from one profi to the next or one perio maintenance to the next. So we help them kind of go back through and look at all that and, and figure out how to get those pa those patients back into so care. So you're, you're, saying, you're saying the, the – um, billing codes, 25 cents a year, income revenue should be perio. Yeah, we measure it a little differently, but it all comes out to be about the same. How, how do you measure so, it? Uh, hygiene. So we look at procedure codes. We compare the scaling root planning codes, perio maintenance codes, and adult profies. But if you if you look at the revenue of hygiene, it's it's not that uh, far off of a, of a comparison as far as how it's measured. The, the, the uh, question, though, is who gets the exam? Because... Ah. Did you book the, the exam to the hygiene production? Because yeah. what, what's your thought? Who gets the exam fee? Because if your doctors Great are question. paid, if your doctors are paid on production, they're going to yeah. get the hygiene yeah. exam. Yeah. So we kind of have, have changed our philosophy on that a bit. It used to be that it we believe that it all went to the hygiene, uh, assuming and considering that the hygienist is doing eighty five percent of that data collection and really handing it off nicely to the dentist. Um, I'd say now with practices that have, you know, multiple associates, um, also with um, kind of us as an industry needing to tighten up our documentation um, and our coding and all of that, we have changed our philosophy and now we recommend that those go to, uh, to the dentist. Um, but again, you know, my point of saying, you know, that you, you talked about the dentists that take their whole team to CE. It's the same thing when you're working in the office. That dentist can't carry all the diagnosis. The dentist can't carry all the marketing. They, you know, they've got to motivate their team to help them do that. And those are the most successful practices when everybody's engaged, whether it's in the appointment verification or, you know, a supporting perio and believing in it. You know, you talk about preemies, um, gingivitis, there's actually a case uh, that was out of Case Western University, and they're doing more and more research on this, um, of a stillbirth that was caused by periobacteria. Um, I have a friend uh, who just had open-heart surgery and showed me his bill, um, million dollars. So imagine if, you know, our treatment of periodontal disease can help reduce our patient's risk of preterm labor, stillbirth, uh, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, stroke, cancer. I mean, this is real stuff. It's not it's not a myth anymore. You know, it's... it's yeah, in that book, um, Beating the Heart Attack Gene. Yes. The guy said, you, you read that book? Yes. I, I just bought four more today to give away at lectures coming up. Well, we'll summarize it. Um, he's going to come on the show later, but but what, what was your takeaway from uh, Beating the Heart Attack Gene? Yeah, so we've been following uh, Brad Bale and Amy Donine for years. In fact, um, several of our coaches 
um, have been to their live preceptor programs. I've taken their online preceptor program. And really what they're teaching is they're teaching uh, the dental industry and the medical industry that there, there are ways to overcome genetic and, um, you know, other types of predispositions for our heart disease and stroke and type 2 diabetes. And most of it comes back to inflammation. And so what they're finding is that these periodontal bacteria, you know, Do Dr. Bale um, will probably share this. He's extremely passionate about this when I hear him speak about it. So it'll be really insightful. You've got to listen to it. Is, you know, multiple studies where um, patients had uh, carotid endorectomy. So they basically open up the carotid artery and scrape out the plaque, right, as a treatment modality. And they find a hundred, one study, 100% of the plaque had periodontal pathogens in it. Um, one of them had uh, 62, I think it was 62% of the samples had more than one periodontal pathogen in it. So these, these pathogens, when we see bleeding gums, that bacteria is going through the bloodstream into all these other parts of the body. And then what it's doing is it's causing these, this plaque to rupture. It's causing this instability and this inflammation in the arteries. And then those plaques rupture, and then that's what causes a cardiac event. So, um, yeah, I, I believe it wholeheartedly. Some people say, well, okay, so maybe someday I'll have to have a heart attack. I mean, maybe I'll have to have a bypass or a stent. The problem that. with that is that, you have 60,000 miles of blood vessels and only three miles of those 60,000 miles can you surgically repair. So all that uh, stuff is happening in your brain, dementia, organs, kidney, liver, all that stuff. Yep. So you said three low hanging fruits. You said one, did you say we care or re or you, we, did you stop calling it recall and now you call it we care? No, but I like that. Hey, I might take that. I might steal that, Howard. That's pretty good. No, re-care re and appointment confirmations is kind of, that's the scheduling piece is one. Uh, perio, making sure that you have a really tight, Does it doesn't have to be overly aggressive. You know, some dentists get really nervous about that, that they're going to drive patients away. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, you know, our clients repeatedly are presenting treatment to patients that they've been seeing for years and years and they're nervous about it. You know, how do I talk to them about it now when I've been seeing this patient for 10 years? And so we give them some verbal skills, you know, we give them ways to really bring the patient alongside them in the diagnosis and, um, and they have great results. So perio. And then the third one is, um, getting the hygiene department really, really tightened up in regards to restorative and operative enrollment. So having them tee that up, I mean, that helps everybody. It helps, you know, the doctor's going to be a lot more likely to come in and do a hygiene exam if she knows that it's going to be concise and it's going to be consistent, she's going to hear the same message and it's going to be effective. You know, when she thinks that she's going to have to come into the hygiene room and start that whole diagnostic process from scratch, then that doctor is a lot less likely to leave their chair. And then the hygienists end up waiting and then it becomes this whole, there's so many things in the practice related to, that are related to hygiene um, that we're not even always aware of. And things that create these kind of cycles of frustration that if we could overcome that, a lot of things would smooth out. The, the best dentists and the best quarterbacks in the NFL have the same thing in common. They're perfectly consistent. And if every time you explain, if every time you diagnose the same way and every time you explain it to the patient the same way, your assistants and hygienists and treatment coordinators and everybody's hearing it, everybody's on message, Everything's consistent. I mean, those quarterbacks, I mean, every single step they have, the, the line can block so well because they know, okay, he's going to throw in four seconds. He's just got to hang on for four. And at four, he's given all he got and can let it go because he knows his quarterback. And, yeah. um, and you have these dentists, and every time they come in, it's different. It's inconsistent. Uh, so she tries to co-diagnose, and he goes somewhere else, and, it's, and finally she just throws in the towel. Um, yeah, I, I'm so gonna, I, Let's elaborate that on, the throwing in the towel, because um, that's exactly what happens is that the hygienist will shut down, right? So, so dentists, whether you like it or not, one of your jobs is to help build up your team's confidence, their confidence in you and their confidence in the team and their confidence in themselves. And so uh, just like you want your team to be consistent, so you want your team to be delivering that message to you when you come in for the hygiene exam the same way every time. And you want between providers, 
So between assistants, between hygienists, you want them to be saying the similar thing. The doctors have to do the same, right? So if you've got multiple doctors, you want to have a very similar treatment philosophy. And then within each doctor, just like you said, come in and, and be consistent with your treatment planning. And then if you do disagree, because you're not, it's not going to be 100% effective, there's going to be times that I'm going to recommend, uh, you know, I'm going to recommend or, or share with the patient, say, you know, doctor's probably going to recommend a crown here. And the doctor may come in and say, you know what, actually, I think we could do an onlay. Well, I, I have enough confidence as a hygienist and I have a, a good enough relationship with my dentist that I work with that I'm not going to take that personally. So as hygienists, we, we can't take that personally. But also, he's going to say something like, you know what, Rachel, I, know, I see exactly why you recommended a crown. And here's the good news. Uh, we can actually preserve more tooth structure because of this. And now all of a sudden... He's built me up, and he's the hero. Instead of saying, "Well, no, I wouldn't do a crown. I would just do an onlay," well, and because know, that, you know, all of a sudden you're throwing the hygienist under their bus without even noticing it, but then they're just going to shut down. You know what we do in our office for thirty years? I have the hygienist diagnose and treatment plan, and the dentists say, "Well, that's illegal," and I say, "Great, let's go to the prison on Sunday and visit all the hygienists in jail." for diagnosing and treatment planning. I mean, right now, someone just drove by your office with three pounds of cocaine in his trunk, and you won't let your hygienist diagnose a cavity. But what yeah. I do, I don't like the uh, top-down command and control. So in our office, if the hygienist said, this is a cavity, uh, an MO on three, and I say, you know, I, I, I don't think so. I think it's a watch. Then we both shut up, and we, we ding the front, and then another hygienist dentist comes in there, and we don't tell them what we said. And then who, whatever they say, we'll say, number three, is there a cavity on three? And if they say, yeah, that's an MO, and then we're just high five, like, okay, you won. Awesome. So we totally democratize awesome. it. Yeah. Totally democratize it. So you're, you're treating your team as colleagues, right? Yeah, and and they, further, furthermore, yeah. that 65-year-old dentist, he, he, can't even, he can't even see his own shoes to tie him. And, and, he, and he's trying to backseat drive a hygienist who's half his age. Who do you think has the working eyeball? to read an x-ray, the 35-year-old hygienist or the 65-year-old with a liver spot. In fact, by the time you have a liver spot, you shouldn't even look at the x-rays. You should just have your hygienist tell you she could be your seeing eye dog. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, and by the way, everybody should be wearing loops too, dentists and hygienists included. And, and, and assistants. And assistants. Yeah. So, I mean, Big we should probably come up with a loop for the business team, right? They probably need loops too. So, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. And, and Howard, you're preaching, you're, you're singing my song because one of the first slides that I bring up when we talk about restorative co-diagnosis is that the I'm not supposed to diagnose myth. I mean, you, we understand and, and you're in Arizona. So, you know, you guys have some different laws than we have, but we understand that if it comes down to it, you know, we're going to, the dentist is taking the responsibility for that diagnosis, but one of the things that dentists forget to do is they forget to train their team so that they are so on point that you can do it like that, right? Is that you can have open conversations about diagnosis. And when, you know, perhaps you go to uh, townie and you learn some new technique and you try it, like share, dentists, share that with your team so that they know what's going on um, and they're, and they're on track with you. And then, Give your, this is the other thing that dentists forget to do, is they think that their team knows that it's okay for them to diagnose. They think they're just not doing it because they're lazy, but that's very often what's happened is the dentist hasn't given them explicit permission. Like, no, I want you to do this. And I want you to take that patient as far down this diagnostic path as possible. And we use this analogy of a house, you know, with the path being the walkway, you know, the patient enters. Well, I don't want the dentist to have to come out the front door of his operatory and walk all the way down the walkway and get the patient and take them. That takes way too much time. If I'm a hygienist, I don't, I don't want my dentist in the, in the operatory that long. So we asked um, a group of dentists, one of them being our, one of our clients, we said, you know, how far do you want your team to take the patients down that path? And he said, I want that patient to be ringing the doorbell. And all I have to do is open the door and say, yep, come on in. And they sit in the chair and do the work. So you got to tell your team how far you want them to take the patients down that path. And you have to be pretty explicit about it. 
Well, Rachel, I mean, if you're going to be a good dentist, right now, if you look at 100 million cavities diagnosed, the, the, the America that will drill, fill, and build 38% of them. So that's one in three. When the team gets involved, when the hygienist is diagnosing or co who who cares who's diagnosing, co-diagnosing? We're not, we're not lawyers. We're, we're patient-centered. And right. what we see is, is some of the offices takes three diagnosed cavities, do one. And then the office next door in the same building is doing two out of three. And mm-hmm. one out of three patients aren't ever going to get it done because all people are talking monkeys and they're crazy. And the difference between drilling and filling and billing two out of three versus one out of three means you're twice as good a dentist. If that hygienist, and, and the other thing is their, their um, patients are intimidated. Like I went to mass every day for 17 years. I never saw one person raise their hand and ask a question. They don't ask questions to doctors, priests, and rabbis, yeah. but they feel more connected to the hygienist, the assistant. Yeah. And then as far as taking everybody to the, um, the, the CE courses, What's the most insane part? We talked about that that hourglass where four people have to call before one gets in the chair. Guess who answers two thirds of all the dental questions in the office? Sure as hell ain't the dentist. It's right. the girl answering the phone, and you decided not to take her to the continued education right. course because it was on endo. And you say, well, that doesn't apply to her. Oh yeah, she just answers sixty percent of all the questions of uh, what is a root canal? Will it yeah. hurt? Do you think I'll have to have one? And she can't even say, well, I don't know. Is your too sensitive to hot and cold? Does it wake you up at night? I mean, so, yeah. 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 Great point. I want to back up and ask you a macroeconomic question. You've been in this thing a quarter of a century. And when you and I started, I started 30 years ago. You were 25 years ago. Um, It was all indemnity insurance. So, you know, we bill the insurance. We bill Delta a thousand bucks for a crown. They'd pay half. We bill them a thousand for a crown. They pay a percent. Now, now 82% of offices are on PPOs and yeah. the fees are dropping down. So a lot of people are thinking, uh, Rachel, with the, you know, if my office is 82% PPOs, do you think I should switch to assisted hygiene instead of having two hygienists for $40 an hour in Phoenix? Yeah. Do you think I should get a $40 an hour hygienist and a $20 an hour assistant? And that yeah. would cut my labor cost 25% because the adjusted production off the PPO is 42% yeah. of the country. What, yeah. What's your thoughts on assisted um, hygiene? I think assisted hygiene can be done very well with some caveats. So so it can be done, you know, like anything. It can be done really well or it can be d- done really poorly. Um, and the really poorly are the ones that people usually hear about or they experience and they say, oh, I would never do that. Like it's the worst thing for the patients. But I've seen it work really well. Uh, and I think some of the keys are you've got to have a really you you got to have a, a top notch dental assistant. Um, I now um, somebody else that you might want to interview about this who's is Stephanie Lotting. Um, I don't know if you've interviewed Stephanie Lotting, but she's super. Um, and she has actually uh, hired a lot of young dental assistants and trained them. So if you have someone in your team that can really train and nurture and mentor these dental assistants and find someone who is very moldable, who wants to learn, who's super eager, has a super great people personality, then this can work. The other option is um, hiring an already trained dental assistant. Someone has a lot of knowledge of dentistry. I've worked with an assistant like that and it was phenomenal. You know, and I just told her, you tell me what to do. You tell me what to do. You tell me where to go. So as a hygienist, I've got to um, I've got to get over myself a bit, Howard. I've got to I've got to not you know be the prima donna hygienist and say, well, I'm not going to have a, an assistant tell me what to do. No, they're going to be my traffic control. I want them to tell me where to go and what what's next. So either you've got to have a really strong training program and have hygienists that are willing to train a fresh general assistant. And have and make sure you hire for people skills, and hire for coachability, or you've got to already have a well-established dental assistant that is very competent, and you've got to have a hygienist who is willing to let that assistant take the lead, and they've got to work as a really tight team. So what doesn't work is if you hire someone and you just think they're gonna clean rooms and take X-rays. That gets boring. Nobody wants to do that for very long. 
you know, they're going to move on. So, or it's just not going to be a good situation. So you really have to engage this person and have them be a very, very integral part of the whole patient experience, I think, for that to work. But that's one that's one solution. And, you know, hey, here's the deal. I was just talking to a dentist the other day uh, in kind of a rural area of Pennsylvania, and he said he got back a reimbursement for a 4342, like a localized quad of therapy that was $35. Well, if he's paying his hygiene as $35, he's going in the hole. There's, there's, you know, it's negative on that procedure because there's usable, there's consumables, right? There's gauze, there's anesthetic, there's the wear and tear on your instrument. So um, we are, I, I, I still see more fee-for-service practices than I think that I will see. Um, so that's always interesting and, and, and uh, pleasantly surprising. We had several that I spoke to this week that are still doing really well. Um, but I think there are, there are some solutions out there, and I think that there are also this. This guy in Pennsylvania said he thought that um, this particular insurance company was trying to get 85 percent of the dentists in Pennsylvania to sign up, and then once they did, now they've got too many, so now they're dropping the reimbursements to try to get people to opt out. And I was like, great, that might be the best thing that ever happened to you. You mentioned uh, Stephanie Lauding. She yeah. was episode 645. Awesome. That's uh, but yeah, um, well, well, you know, podcasts are a lot of kids, and so you know, this is heavily weighted to the under thirty. What okay. are your thoughts in general about PPOs? Do you, do you think it's something where this is reality? You got to sign up for all the PPOs, or or what, what? What are your what are your thoughts on PPOs? When you guys go in and consult with offices, do you analyze the fees they're getting? Like how much is hygienist costs? Like in Phoenix, yeah. you, you said a thirty five dollar hour hygienist. I mean, Phoenix, they're 40. In right. San Francisco, Please. they're 50. Manhattan, it could be 75. Do you analyze what you're paying these hygienists yes. and what the PPO plans are paying for cleanings and all this? Yes. yes. We look at, uh, we look at per, col uh, collectible production, right? So collectible production. Is that the same as adjusted production? Yes. Yes. Okay. Compared to hygiene compensation. So, yes, we do look at that. And uh, we look at, you know, particularly if the practice is at a point where they're considering hiring another hygienist, if their reimbursements are really low, I mean, this is no secret. It's, you know, sometimes it's just not even worth it. It would be better to drop a plan um, that, or go to assisted hygiene, you know, than to hire another hygienist and, and go even deeper in, you know, into the hole of that. And, and I, I hate to say that, but I mean, if you have to look at it from a business perspective too, and what I don't want to see is when I hear things like $35 on a, a, a you know, limited quadrant of scaling replanning, what comes to my mind is the salaries of the dentist and the assistants and everybody on the team. You know, if those are reimbursements, something's going to have to give and, and how's that get, going to affect our dental salaries? So I think that, um, you know, it depends on where you are. And I heard you say recently about, you know, um, folks getting out and building, you know, a new practice or wanting to buy a practice and everyone wanting to be in a metropolitan area. And, you know, I live in Charlotte Metro, so I have all the benefits of that. So it's easy for me to say. But our a lot of our most successful practices are in rural areas um, where they don't have as much competition. I mean, I'm sure it's that way in Phoenix and Charlotte. There's a dentist on every other corner. And um, so when you're in that situation, you, you sometimes have to do things to be competitive, but it doesn't, and, and, and you know, I've, you know I've, there's lots of different opinions about this. I'd say most of our clients are participating at some level. Um, and I would say that maybe 20% um, are almost 100% PPO with very little fee for service. And there's probably another 20% that are still, com maybe 25% or 30% that are still completely fee-for-service, and then everybody else is somewhere in the middle. And, you know, they're maybe taking some of the higher reimbursement plans. Now, when it gets really into, like, a really heavy PPO practice and they're asking us those questions, we refer to a, a PPO um, expert, you know, to do analysis um, and really look at how could that affect the practice. Because, you know, as I'm a business owner, and, um, you know, as 
if 40% of my business was coming from one referral source, it's a, it's a little scary to um, it's a little scary to drop that referral source. I mean, we've had similar things happen or similar conversations in our business, and it's scary to think about dropping that referral source. But if if you can really get down to the math and look at what it might mean to your overall collections, then very often it makes sense. And who is your short list of uh, PPO experts that you yeah, send to that with, office? Um, we've worked with Unlock the PPO. Uh, we've worked with uh, Teresa Duncan with Odyssey Management, um, and um, I don't know if she specifically does that PPO analysis piece. Uh, Roy Shelburne um, also is fantastic. He's one of our go-to resources, Dr. Roy Shelburne. I'm sure you've had him on the podcast. You're going to look him up. Um, and uh, he, he's on our short list, too, of just helping our clients navigate some of that and also figuring out, you know, when there are services, because things are happening. I, I was at a speaking engagement in Virginia recently, and one of our clients was there. And he came up to me, and he's like, look, this, this company is not only denying reimbursement, but they're, they're disallowing this periotherapy on a patient that obviously has periodontal disease. And it is getting so it, – it almost makes you – I mean, it, it's not just about the money. It's getting to where it's about the care. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny how, um, you know, all seven and a half billion earthlings are trapped on the same rock flying around the sun. And, and I've noticed through lecturing uh, internationally for 25 years, what's going on in one country is going on on the other side of the world. You know, it, it's, it's really more homogenous than anybody was think. But I've seen this rodeo before at the NHS. I remember 30 years ago. The, the fees just kept getting lower and lower and lower. And finally, the first guys are saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm losing money and the care is horrible. So yeah, the first know. guys started trickling out 15 years ago. And now 5,000 of the 20,000 have left it completely. So the PPOs, if, it, if, it's just, if, it's, if it's just a slippery slope to the bottom, then, um, then America's going to wake up to the fact that 40% of Americans don't even have insurance. That's what I don't understand about the, the, uh, the dentist is, when you say, well, why don't you spend 5% of collection going after the 40% of America without insurance? They go, nah, I don't want to do that. And then you send them a PPO. Hey, why don't you do your dentistry 42% off? Okay, right. fine. So so they don't blink at, at doing it 40 And then the other thing about uh, when they're adding another hygienist, I mean, the average dentist gardener is smarter than he is or she is because they all do selective pruning. When they start, when they do your landscaping, they plant eight trees because they don't know if one or two or three are going to die. And then by the time they all start getting bigger, they select a prune to three. So this dentist wants to add another hygienist. Why don't you evaluate those PPOs? Maybe what you should do is say, you know, okay, we're doing 12 PPOs. Let's selectively prune off three that were yeah. breaking even or losing money or they're affecting the care of my patients. Selective yeah. pruning is what some of these are. So I want to ask you the other questions. And, and we do give advice on that selective pruning. Uh, in fact, any one of her, she just helped one of her clients do that. It's just when it gets really complex um, and there are large numbers of patients that are in a particular plan, that's when we, we feel like we need to partner with someone. Oh, that yeah, because if you're losing money, it just feels better when you're losing money on several hundred people instead of just one. I mean, you know, I can selectively prune <laughs> losing money on one guy but when you're saying i'm losing money on hundreds i gotta keep doing it because i'm a talking monkey <laughs> with clothes on you know when when dentists go to the zoo they're the only animal with clothes on all the other ones are naked and don't have crazy thoughts um i, I want to ask you another question uh, dentists always ask i mean i've been asked this a million times you think you should pay your hygienist hourly or production great question so I will say that the most motivated hygienists that we see have some type of incentive, and usually it is tied to their performance. Um, I'd say probably the, the one that we see that's the most effective is like a, a, a hybrid, a base plus some type of commission. And typically the base is a little lower than what the going rate is. Uh, and then they have to hit the three to one. So they have to hit, they have to produce three times what their total compensation package is. And then once they've hit that, then whatever's over that, they get a percentage of that. So you, uh, you think hygiene salary should be one third of hygiene, uh, revenue collect adjusted production 
revenue yeah. to the hygiene department minus the exams that went to the doctor. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, if you talk to anybody who has a PhD in economics, they say you, you got to incentivize people. And you just said that the best hygiene departments you see, there's some type of incentive program. Yeah, and we've seen all different kinds. I mean, we've seen it even where, Howard, they're pooled. So uh, we worked with one office in Texas years ago, and they had about four or five hygienists. And they worked on a pooled commission. So they put all the production together for the hygienists, and all the hygienists were paid the same amount from that pooled uh, production. So they're all helping each other. Um, the tricky thing is, too, is you've got to – the, the tricky thing is there's pros and cons to everything. There's pros and cons to hourly. There's pros and cons to salary. There's pros and cons to straight commission. And one of the cons to commission is the, is the teamwork aspect. So you just have to really look at the people that you have on board and make sure you've got team players and folks that aren't just out, you know, for themselves. Because if there's even a hint of that, then that, that production um, compensation model sometimes will, it will accelerate that. Well, a, 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 HR is always the hardest part. I don't care if you own a football team, yeah. a basketball yeah. team, a dental It doesn't matter. I don't care if you're running a school, the Department of Motor Vehicles. I mean, HR <laughs> is the toughest job. And the most successful dentists are part-time armchair psychologists, leaders, motivators, and it, whether it's with their patient, their team. I mean, that that's that's the whole damn game. And uh, it, it, it's the hardest to train about. You know, it's it's just so hard. So, what do you what do you actually? This is dentistry uncensored. So, get to the nitty gritty. What do you actually do? What does it cost for a dentist to call you? How much does it cost? Do you come in there for one day, three days? Do you come back once a year, once every? Tell yeah. us what you do. What what's yeah. the lowdown? So, our primary we have some online training, but our primary product is our private coaching. And, um, and we have quite a few clients that stay with us, us for years. We're building a master's program so the dentists can just continue to send their hygienists and send their teams to us over and over and keep them engaged and motivated and growing. Uh, but typically the dentists come in, uh, they call us up and say, hey, you know, I was visiting with uh, my friend or I was talking to my CPA or my financial planner uh, and my hygiene department hasn't grown in a long time frustrated. I had one doctor I talked to this week. I talked to him three years ago and he finally circled back around. I said, so I looked at your numbers again. They're exactly the same as they were three years ago. He said, yeah, that's why we're talking. So he was ready. He was ready to make the change. Uh, really great guy. Sometimes, you know, it's a lot to, uh, dentists are sometimes very slow to make decisions. I find they're either drivers and they go, 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 let's do it. Or they think about it for three years and then they circle back around. Um, so the way we start is we have a couple different levels of programs. We have one called our Kickstart program, which starts uh, at around um, 20, 2900 a month for about four months plus a deposit. And um, that's typically for a practice that's up to about four hygienists. Once they start getting a, bigger, a little bit bigger, then we charge a little more. Uh, we also work with groups. We've got several clients that have multiple locations, and so we work with some small groups, um, and we do customized pricing for them, obviously. And that program really works on one topic. It's one two-day visit followed by about three months of coaching calls, and that's usually the practice that they've got everything else is running great, and they want to work on their perio program. Um, our program that we enroll in the most is called Elevate. It's 12 months. Uh, it's two two-day visits in the office, and um, uh, for about half that time, the team is seeing patients, so we don't try to shut down the office for two whole days. We try to keep them seeing patients as much as possible. Uh, and then the, the second day is a full team workshop where everybody's there, everybody's engaged. And then there's coaching support all along the way. We do some pre-work. We do a very detailed analysis of the hygiene department and then track the progress. And really customize it to what the, the client's looking for. I mean, obviously, the, the top three things that we work on are, are the perio program, really getting that refined, whether they don't have one at all and they're starting from scratch, or they do and they want to add things like um, advanced diagnostics, you know, which is one of the things that um, Brad Vale might talk about, you know, when he comes on the podcast. They highlight that uh, in the Beat the Heart Attack gene. Um, Stephanie Lotting does a lot of that as well. Um, or other diagnostics, they want to, uh, you know, just up-level their perio program. The co-diagnosis piece, 
And then the whole scheduling and patient flow, those are probably our top three, top three topics. And then just communication, you know, how do we talk to our patients? And, and, um, and, you know, sometimes we get in the middle of some of the HR things. We're working with a, a client right now that uh, bought a practice and his hygienist were basically at about 50% commission. And he's having to break the news to them that that's going to have to change. And so the good thing about that is they had zero perio, so we can help them ramp up their their services and production while this compensation change is happening and offset that a bit. But you know, well, you know that that's why corporate is moving away from buying offices and going de novo, because most of these offices that they buy say they have like thirty five percent labor. And they got to get it to 28%. And they have to go in there and say, well, I'm sorry your doctor gave you a dollar raise every time the earth went around the sun. But we don't base raises on astrology. Yeah. We actually have a formula. And, um, you know, and they say, you know, you, when you go in there and have to cut everybody's pay by 20% because doctor's best idea was to sign up for a PPO, which lowered the fee 42%. Well, you know, yep. the only secret to lower prices is lower costs. When you when you accepted 42% reduction fee, did you lower your staff's fee? Did you say, I'll go 42% faster? Um, instead of doing $1,000 a day, I'll do, you know, 14. They, they don't have any plan. They just said, no, my, my only idea was just to give everyone a raise every year while signing up for more PPOs. Yeah. And it's a disaster. And then I want to say it to my homies out there. So, so the kick starts $2,900 a month for four months. The Elevate is how much a month for 12 months? Yeah, so there's a deposit. So for a four hygienist practice, it's about $5,600 deposit, and then uh, Elevate's $2,100 a month for 10 months. So it ends up being around $27,000 uh, for a four hygiene. And that, I mean, they can, they can but double four that. Hygiene, what, that, that, that those, are the, those are the big boys. Um, what, what is the average... What is the average dental office size? I think the average dental office is still two hygienists. So that's our that's our that's our fee for up to four hygienists. And then if but they see, have then, to see, you're just making my point. I just exposed your bias, and I've been saying this for eight hundred shows in a row. You look at data from an economist that works for the American Dental Association. What's that guy's name? We had on. I can't say his name. Marco Vucicek. Marco Vucicek. And um, genius guy. The average office is doing 750 Totally successful consultant like you has been doing it for 20 years. You say, well, you know, the average office has two hygienists, but most of our clients have four. Ding, ding, well, ding, 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 ding. Exactly. Because everyone exactly. using consultants are it's millionaires. And then, yeah. and then you'll see this. You'll go, I'm not spending $27,000 on yeah. building my business. I'm going to go buy a shiny object with lights on it, preferably with a dial and an antenna. Or he'll say, well, you know what? If I went to this forensic odontology conference <laughs> to identify dead people, that in TMJ will be a big practice. Or they'll go into sleep after. He's like, dude, get your house in order. I mean, yeah. she. how could she do this for 25 years if that if the office that paid her twenty seven thousand yeah. didn't get their money back multiple. in six months, well, it, yeah, it's a multiple, and, and that's the bias all, of consultants. They yeah. all think every yeah. dental office is twice as good as what uh, the people, and it's the same thing in every conference. The right half of the room, every row is an entire dental office. Those guys are all making three fifty, four hundred. Then you go to the other side of the room; it's a bunch of individuals saving money. And their wife they couldn't come because she's out selling Amway. And, uh, you know, they're all making, um, you know, half the money. You got to get the whole team involved. And the number one return on investment is to get your house in order, get poised for growth, get mean and lean. And then you can go play with sleep apnea and forensic odontology going down to the morgue on Friday night. I mean, whatever. <laughs> whatever flips your flipper, boys have toys, whatever. But get your house in order. How, long, yeah. how many offices have you got their hygiene house in order? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. Hundreds. And and they always tell us, the dentists say, okay, A, um, you know, it, other than the work that the hygienists, hygienists are sending to the doctor's chair, right, which they want, keep them busy, the rest of it is is their hygienists are happier because they're not just running through a profi over and over and over, right? They're actually able to engage their brain and talk to these patients and and be a colleague to the dentist. Um, the patients are healthier. 
the the dentist isn't having to do all of this production. So every time they add a new service, that's more that they're doing. Um, and the patients show up in their chair and they're not bleeding all over the place when they want to, when they're doing a crown prep because the period has been treated and their team believes in the treatment that the hygiene's doing. It just has all of these trickle down effects. And, um, you know, we just, we get, we get doctors tell us all the time, like, Oh my gosh, my hygienist used to hate coming to work. And she just gave me a note that said, thank you for investing in us. I love my job again. And now all of a sudden they're going to stay right? You're not going to have employee turnover. You're going to have people that really care and really engage and want to build your practice. And, and you make your investment back over and over and over. Well, human, humans need deodorant and motivation every day. You can't I do can. something yep. for 10, 20, 30 years. That's I mean, right. just, just like you talking about, he's been married 20 years. They'll say we had great years, average years, some bad yeah. years. Um, well, I want you to talk about, uh, what do you mean when you uh, say, that what happens in the first 20 minutes of a hygiene visit affects the entire practice. Yeah, so uh, one of the exercises that we go through in a lot of my speaking programs is I, I have the dentist write down, okay, what do you think your hygienist does in the hygiene exam every time without fail? So, for example, um, if you have a 60-minute hygiene appointment, you know, we, you can break it down. Twenty minute, first 20 minutes is uh, the evaluation, the assessment. So, so the first step is, how much time is being spent on that in your practice, okay? So if your hygienists are seating the patient and then six minutes later they're scaling, then not very much time is being spent on the diagnostics. Probably not uh, consistent period charting happening, probably not intraoral photos happening, probably not real thorough, you know, co-diagnosis happening. It's all about the scaling. But if we reserve that first 20 minutes and, and the hygienist is really spending that time doing all that data collection, then all of a sudden there's all this treatment that comes out of it. But what if they aren't doing a perio exam, for example? So they're not doing the perio assessment. And so now all of a sudden that patient is, has periodontal disease, but it's not getting diagnosed. And that hygienist is having to work super hard on the prophy and they're running behind. And then the patient, the next patient sitting out in the reception area and they're staring at the, 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 the person that's at the working in the front, right, staring at them because they're like, why, why is my hygienist running late? Why haven't you seated me? Then all of a sudden there's another patient that hasn't been diagnosed with Perry with a doctor's chair. She's trying to do a crown prep and it's running behind. Now all of a sudden the next patient of the doctors is staring at the, you know, practice manager. Doctors, because the, the ble tissue's bleeding, doctor and assistant are having a hard time. You know, all of these things, plus you've got liability, you know, if we're not doing oral cancer screening or we're not doing a perio screening, there's liability because of undiagnosed treatment. Um, there's the production that's lost. There's the board hygienist that's just doing one prophy after another. It's like all of those things could have been improved if there was a clear cut plan of what happens in that first 20 minutes and it happens consistently. And then all of a sudden the hygienist calls for an exam, doctor exam, doctor's running over, there's two patients waiting and now me, the hygienist, I'm calling for an exam when if I had done that perio charting and carved out the time to do that, all of those problems could have been eliminated. And you also talk about what dentists have forgotten to do that would dramatically increase their team's effectiveness with enrolling restorative treatment. Yeah, so we talked about that. So they've forgotten to really train them on their treatment philosophy and continue to train them, right? So as doctors learn new things, as they use new services, their team has got to be on point. Just like you said, like they, the, the team has got to be able to diagnose better as well or better than the dentist. So in order for them to do that, the dentist has got to really train them so that they're all calibrated on their treatment philosophy and then give them that permission. So we talked about that. And I, and I want to talk about, um, you know, um, and by the way, you know, when I, when I, uh, throw my homies under a bus. I do it with love. I mean, I, I do love dentists. I really, I really do love my homies, um, and I do think they're doing a far better job than MDs. Uh, the only, the only great businesses I see. I mean, the dentists, the vets, and the chiropractors are running ten times a better business than the one million MDs, which are clueless. But I know they always want to learn dentistry. But my, my top two investments. Um, number one is consultants. Number one. But number two, when you said, you know, the hygienist running late and that patient's out there because you said, and it rolled off your tongue because 
she's looking at the clock and she hadn't been seated yet. She's wondering, how come I haven't been seated yet? And then I look at the cost. The number one cost is a it's not even on your on your P and L, your statement of income. It's a forty two percent adjusted production from you charge a thousand, but you sign up the PV over six hundred. Number two, twenty eight percent labor. Number three, ten percent lab. Number four, six percent supplies. Operatory chairs aren't even in your top ten cost. And every time I analyze dental offices and I say, what are what are you remember, Mr. Rogers? One of these things don't look like the other. When the people are always netting. Three to four hundred. One of the top three variables they always have. They always have extra chairs. Mm -hmm. They always have an operatory that no one even sat in because when you're running late, I mean, we talked about assisted production. There's there's various levels of that. When the yeah. ladies running yeah. late, if you just seat the patient, maybe yeah. the assistant can go over there and take her X-rays. Yeah. Maybe the receptionist can just sit down with her and talk to her and update her health yeah. history, but. In process waiting yes. is infinitely shorter than pre process waiting in the mind of a monkey. And, and sometimes, I mean, I'm a pathological liar because I will go in there and numb up my next patient. And I look at Jen, I say, Jen, how long should this soak in? And she's like, 25 minutes, which means <laughs> I'm running 25 minutes late. Huh? But if I tell you, Rachel, I don't want to hurt yeah. you. We're doing a root canal. I'm going to let, I want this to soak in for yeah. half an hour. And then I'm going to come in and it'll have worn off and I'll give you a booster shot and we'll do the root canal instantly. Uh, but, uh, but you know what I mean? But yeah. in process waiting is yeah. better than pre-process waiting. Yeah. And why these dentists um, are going to spend, you know, 38 hours out of uh, 32 hours out of 160 hours, they're going to spend 19% of their life. And they had to make this operatory, this little 10 foot by 11 foot wedge to save a nickel. And then you go home to their house, their front room, their dining room. They got all these big rooms. Right. The operatories need to be bigger. And you need to keep adding operatories until you don't need one. Because operatories shouldn't match the flow like an assembly line uh -huh. where every hour we have a hygiene department. The operatories got to match the flow. Sometimes we have walk-ins. Sometimes we yeah. have cancellations. Sometimes we're running late. So the number of operatories has to match the flow, not the total aggregate demand i mean uh yeah. but hey so they're gonna order your book they go to inspiredhygiene.com it says click here to order and then you right, howard, uh howard i'm gonna interrupt you if i may yeah go to roh book that's the easiest way to get there roh book.com and then you're going to enter howard all caps and then you'll get 50 percent off half off the book and we will ship it to you and uh, I, another thing you might want to do, I think you should write a uh, book review on it because we got um, Dental Town Magazine, which goes 125,000 yeah. dentists. And then we got, a, I don't know if it probably wouldn't apply to Ortho Town Magazine because there's a few orthodontists that are doing yeah. magazine, like Ben Burris in Arkansas. Yeah. Did, you, did you follow all that? I'm familiar with him, yes. That, that, that went all the way to the Arkansas State Supreme Court. I mean, he, he was so passionate that yeah. he thought when these kids are coming in getting their ortho appointment, he's a real doctor why can't he have a hygienist yeah. and uh and arkansas um um that, that was a big deal but anyway you, you should write a book review on this yeah uh, dental town do magazine i would love to do that yeah so i'm uh howard at dentaltown.com the editor is uh tom jacoby since the year 2000 he's been up for 17 years so he's tom is it tom at dentaltown tom at dentaltown.com and or and or even an online CE course. I mean, these are all just different podcasts. I mean, there's really no difference in an article, a podcast, an online CE course. But the online CE courses, uh, that's um, HOGO because I'm Howard at Dentaltown.com. He's Howard Goldstein. So he goes by HOGO, H-O-G-O, at Dentaltown.com. Um, and um, but I think the online CE courses, we put up 411 courses. They're coming up on like something like 700,000 views. Because you get ADA credit, AGD yes. credit. Yeah. And the other thing that um, the online C courses are doing is um, so many dentists are using them for uh, lunch and learns with their staff. Yeah. And they'll sit there and say, okay, um, you know, Friday, uh, we're going to stop seeing patients at noon. I'm going to pay you for an hour, but I'm going to yeah. provide lunch, but I want you to watch this course. Because a lot of these dentists are realizing that if they, if they stop an hour early once a week, Buy everybody lunch. You have to pay them. If you mandate they yes. be there, you got to pay them. Yeah. The only way they can uh, not pay them is volunteer. But stop an hour early, 
get a bunch of pizza, send someone to choke and puke and get a bunch of crap and let them all sit around and eat, but let everybody as a team watch a third party online CE course yeah. because the receptionist is answering all the questions. The assistant always wondered what the hell you were doing in the tooth for so long. And the hygienist is going to be in there for an hour to explain this whole thing. And they'll feel comfortable <laughs> to ask her questions. And then yeah. when doctor walks in, they're just like, oh, do you have any questions? No. It's, I mean, and every time I've asked my assistant, Jan, for 30 years, every time I ask a patient, well, do you have any questions? They say no. And then I walk out of the room. And then what do they turn to Jan and say? Six questions. But, yeah. Do I really need that? And what is the crown? And yeah. And, and, and you know what's, what the questions all have in common? They're all trust. Uh, really? Do I really have two cavities? Yeah. Really have to get them done? Really? They'll if I don't do them, they'll turn to her. It's because we sell the invisible. Just yeah. like with, just like when the yeah. guy, just like when I go get my oil change, he says you need to flush your transmission fluid. How would I, what would I base that on? Right. No point around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it, we we sell the invisible, and so you can show me like my transmission fluid that's full of trash. Done. Yeah. So that's where the intro photos come in, right? And the things like that. The more we can. We can uh, back up what we're saying with that proof. Then we shortcut that whole trust piece, I think. And we, we, or not shortcut it, we fast track it. We fast track from the invisible to, okay, I see what you're talking about. All right, let's do that. But I still think the biggest trust buster in the hygiene department is when you keep losing your hygienist and you keep getting a different hygienist every yeah. two or three years. Yeah. And that's another thing. When I go in there and see these, amazingly huge dental offices. They got hygienists have been there 20 years. Some yeah. of them are so old, they eventually have to take them to a vet and put them down. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, keeping your staff says yeah. the most about trust. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, Hey, I've been a fan of yours for 25 years. Send oh. me over, uh, your Phoenix girl, Miller light, Kim, yeah, Miller, well, I'll Miller, connect. Kim Miller. And, um, it, um, I would love to podcast her and, you know, um, Maybe I'll have her consult my office. That thing's 30 years old. I was sitting there thinking, I wonder when the last time my hygienist, they've all, I think everybody got in the cruise when they're a decade or more and just in the hygiene department, that might be fun to do. But hey, Rachel, thank Love you that. so much for coming thank on my you. show today. I had an awesome time. You're very Me informative. Too. Thank you, Howard. It's a pleasure. Have fun. All Take right. Care. Tell T-Bone I said hi. I will.